Hi, this is Diane, and I'm going to try and go out of my comfort zone and do this as a video response. So, while it may not seem so at first, collecting data on sex and gender is at least as complex as collecting data on sexuality. The video we saw from Mount Sinai nicely demonstrated some of the complications involved in collecting data from patients, because even someone like a researcher who is intensely invested in having this data collected could easily be very frustrated answering these questions when they're the one who is the ill or injured patient. I did like the way the nurse in the video sandwiched the question in between other more familiar demographic questions, thereby just normalizing the fact that this is being asked. Of all the articles we read, I was the most partial, partial to Krieger and Springer et al. in their approaches. All acknowledged that distinctions between sex and gender exist, but I think these two took the most comprehensive approaches to dealing with those distinctions in research. Krieger looks at the effects of biological sex and gender relations as they impact health risk exposures and outcomes, while Springer et al. advocate for designing studies that control for biological factors, social factors, and entangled biosocial factors so that we can ferret out root causes. One thing that a few articles referenced was the difference in cardiac symptom presentation between cisgender women and cisgender men. We know these exist. We have ideas about why. I think that a study that deliberately included both trans women and trans men and controlled for biological, social, and biosocial differences might help us ferret out exactly what's going on. The definition of transgender that I'm most partial to is a person whose gender identity and sex assigned at birth are not aligned. That's really broad, but I think that leaves room then to follow up with more granular questions to ferret out differences in hormonal exposure, lived experience, or even genetics, depending on what's being studied. When I collected gender data for my master's study, I relied entirely on self-report and simply asked people what gender they identified as, left that as a fill in the blank, and then asked whether or not they considered themselves transgender. Again, made sense at the time. If I were studying specific health outcomes, however, I'd be more inclined to use an approach I learned about at the GLAMA conference last week. I need to find my notes with the name of the presenter so that I can credit appropriately. But this presenter said that in their practice, they collect sex assigned at birth, gender identity, and legal sex. That last one is to anticipate and hopefully avoid any insurance issues around, for example, billing for a pap test done on a trans man or a PSA done on a trans woman. They also do a comprehensive organ inventory, looking at organs present from birth, organs that have been surgically altered, such as you know, a brain tumor excision or genital reconstruction, and any organs that have been actually removed, which would include things like tonsils, ovaries, testes. Um, for primary care, you would need to be completely comprehensive, and if you were doing a longitudinal, super-involved epidemiological study, then you would also want to be that comprehensive. In the cardiac symptom case, for example, though, you might be able to just take that data on the heart, lungs, I would say adrenal glands because of the stress factor, ovaries, uterus, testes, vagina, and or penis. Um, my last parting thought, as I'm already at almost three and a half minutes, is that I wish the Kaufman chapter was available in an updated form. I grabbed the more recent um, Fenway guide and was disappointed to see that it's just absent. Um, because several changes have taken place since that article was published in 2008, including the change in the DSM-5 from pathologizing a person's gender identity to a more accurate diagnosis of gender dysphoria. So it would have been interesting to see how those changes would have been reflected while hopefully keeping the wonderful Kafka reference. And now that I'm approaching four minutes, I am going to sign off.